so yeah, thanks very much for inviting me down. Um, Travelled down yesterday. Um, I was just talking to somebody in the audience, and uh, when I did the presentation similar to this in Bustleton, it was called uh, "Just Add Water." <laughs> I think that's the last thing you want to do at the moment, isn't it? Uh, it's been very wet, and uh, coming down and stopping off at the Williams Wool Shed and having a uh, the world famous sausage roll there, um, and then getting to Cogent up, and all of a sudden it's like a lake. It's just unbelievable. So, um, what we've got up there is uh, another weather system that we had which brought a lot of wind and rain to the Midwest. Um, and it's just an indication of the sort of variability that we can get with our weather pattern. So what I'm hoping to do today is to be able to explain in very, very broad terms why we get the sort of weather that we get, why we get the wet winters and the dry summers, and hopefully also touch on things called climate drivers which are basically there to aid what we call the global circulation pattern. Um, first question, anybody here doesn't believe the Earth is round? Any flat earthers in? Are there any flat earthers in? Good, let's get that one out of the way straight away because there are some people out there who do believe the Earth is flat and if they did they're in for a really, really bad time during this one because the Earth is round and because it is round, we get a variation in weather. It's because of the shape of the planet that we get the weather that we do. So the global circulation occurs because the Earth is round. And at the equator, you get the sun's rays coming in, as you do at the poles. It's exactly the same amount of energy that's hitting the Earth at the equator as it is at the poles. But the area at the equator, because the Earth is round, is much, much smaller where that energy is uh, absorbed than over the poles. So there is more heat going in at the equator than there is at the poles. That leads to an energy imbalance. And basically, weather is the way that that energy imbalance is redistributed across the planet. We cannot have the Earth continually getting hotter and hotter and hotter at the equator and getting colder and colder and colder at the poles. So there's a redistribution of that heat from the equator to the poles by the weather in the form of winds and precipitation. All good so far? Good, stay with me. When you heat air, what happens to it? Well, it tells you on the slide, so there's no guesses, there's no prizes here. When you heat it, it rises, okay? As it rises, the invisible gas, the water vapor, will cool. As it cools, as long as conditions are right, it will condense. And when it condenses, it turns into water, or as we know it, cloud. So it cools, condenses, and gives you cloud. So that's three C words associated with weather already. There's a fourth, and that's the one that you call us when we get it wrong. <laughs> See, we're getting right down into the gutter straight away. That's where I'm comfortable. That's another C word. Um, so, the air rising, cooling, condensing, that leads to clouds. That also gives us, as the air rises, also gives it areas of low pressure. The opposite to air rising, cooling, and condensing is air sinking, warming, and drying, leading to high pressures. So, areas of high pressure are areas of descending air where cloud won't form and areas of low pressure are areas of ascending air where cloud will form, okay? So we have a major area of ascending air over the planet, and that's where all the heating is going on, and that's at the equator. So if we weren't to have any sort of rotation, if we weren't to have any mountains, any oceans, this is what a general thermally direct, as we call it, circulation would look like. You have air rising at the equator, moving up, moving north and south from the equator. It gets to a height, and it does vary from where you are on the planet, but there's a bit of a lid in the atmosphere. So we live in an area called the troposphere, okay? And at the top of the troposphere is a lid called the tropopause, and above the troposphere is the stratosphere. All the weather that we have is basically stuck in the troposphere. So to all intents and purposes, we're trapping the air around about 10 to 15 kilometers. We don't let it go any higher than that. So all of that weather is occurring in that 10 to 15 kilometer box, if you like. So the air hits the top of the box and spreads north and south. 
in this idealized situation, it starts to sink at the poles. Okay, so we have drying air going on through there. So we would have a high pressure system at the pole and a low pressure system at the equator. If you can think of it like a mountain where you have a high area and a low area, if you were to boot a ball or roll a marble from the top of a mountain, where will it go? It will go down. It will go towards the low area. And that's what the air does as well. It moves from high pressures to low pressures. So we have this direct circulation where the air is rising, hits the top of that box and moves north and south, then sinks, hits the ground, and then because it's a high pressure, it moves back towards the low pressure system. Okay? Now, can you see on that diagram where we've got the air moving from the north hemisphere and the southern hemisphere, and they then collide yet another C word? To give its technical term, that is convergence. Okay? So convergence, as you bring air together, as air converges, it goes up as well. So we've got the thermally direct upward motion and we've got the convergent motion as well to give us all of this cloud over that equator, equator area and little or no cloud over the pole. Driest continent on Earth? Antarctica. Okay. And the other problem that you've got with the Antarctic as well is that you have a huge mountain range there and the air just slides down off that as well. So it's very, very dry in the Antarctic um, and then that, all of that air is moving to the north. It's not quite as simple as that though. Um, so when we look at it on a reality basis, we have two or three areas going on. So we still have that region of air that's going up at the equator, but instead of going all the way to the poles, it starts to rise and move north and south and sink at around about 30 degrees north and south. Where is Southwest WA? It's around about 30 degrees. So the west, southwest of WA is nearly always under the influence of this area of high pressure. To give its technical term, the subtropical ridge. Okay. Now when it hits the ground at about 30 degrees north or south, what's it going to do? Is it going to go through the ground or is it going to spread north and south? Spread north and south. Okay, so it moves north and south. When it moves south, in this area in here, it starts to hit the air, that convergence of the air moving out from the polar region or the Antarctic, and then it collides, it converges, and we get more up motion, and that occurs around about 50 to 60 degrees south, and that is where the cold fronts are. So you have an area of low pressure over the equator, an area of high pressure around southwest WA, and then an area of low pressure around 40, 50, 60, uh, 50 to 60 south, which is where all the cold fronts are. And then you have a semi-permanent high over the poles. Make sense? I just made it up. <laughs> no. Global circulation. So, does that, does that sit like that all the time? No, it doesn't. This is an idealised thing. It's like everything in the real world. It's not as we've seen it in, in the books. But when this was first put together, this idea, there were no real ways of, of checking if this was true or not. And then we started to get satellites coming in, and then we started to see that things really did pan out the way that they are. So this is an infrared satellite image where the darker colours represent warmer temperatures and the lighter colours represent colder temperatures. So the clouds are showing up as bright white areas Okay, and the land is showing up as dark, especially up through, um, I'm loath to do this, but I'll have a crack there. So up through this area in North America. That is really, really hot. What's going on in North America at the moment are bushfires, just like we had a couple of years ago in Eastern Australia. And the temperatures are really, really hot there. There's been some really hot temperatures in through Europe as well. There's heat waves going on through there. So that's showing up on the infrared. But the key here, is this area running across the equator, okay? This is where all of that uplift is going on. It comes up and moves south and north into these areas in here where there's relatively little cloud, okay? So we can see where those high pressure systems are. They're not continuous, they're broken up. And then certainly, and then down to the south, you've got this run of these buggers in here 
the low pressure systems, which is where we're getting all the rain from in the winter. Okay, one there, one there, one there, one there, one there. There's another one out in here. Okay, and then there's another one here. You can see it's not quite uniform, but it's there. Okay, so that global circulation pattern has been proven by observation, so we're quite happy with that. Is it the same throughout the whole year? No, it's not. So what happens in the, in the summer in terms of temperature? Does it get hotter or colder? It gets hotter, pretty easy. And in the winter it gets colder, yeah? That's because the Earth is at an angle, tilted, and we get the rotation around the Earth, and that means that you get more energy in the winter season for us in the northern hemisphere and then more energy in the summer season for us in the southern hemisphere. So there's an energy imbalance going on because of the rotation of the Earth around the Sun. Okay, so as well as that energy imbalance because of the shape of the Earth, the orbit of the Earth also gives us the seasons. And that means that those pressure systems move in relation to that energy change. So during the summer months, when all of the energy is coming into the southern hemisphere, that high pressure system moves southwards. And in the winter months, the high pressure system moves northwards. So what does that look like? That is the position of the subtropical ridge, that high pressure system, during the winter months. Now, which way do the winds blow around a high pressure system? Clockwise or anticlockwise? Anticlockwise. Okay, easy way to remember that. Another name for a high pressure system is an anticyclone. Okay, so anticlockwise for an anticyclone, clockwise for a cyclone, unless you're in the northern hemisphere. And then it's the opposite way around. But who cares? Okay, nobody, because we live in the southern hemisphere. All right? So, because the winds blow anticlockwise around an anticyclone, what direction is that wind roughly blowing into southwest WA? From the east or the west? From the west. Is that blowing from the ocean or the land? Is it dry or wet? Congratulations, you are now weather forecasters. <laughs> okay, so we have moist air coming into us over the winter months. What happens in the summer? I think you can guess. Okay, in the summer months, that high pressure system moves south. It moves south of the state. So now instead of the winds blowing from the west, they're blowing from the east. Dry or wet? Dry. Hot or cold? Hot. Okay. So there you go. My work here is done. What happens in the southeasterly drizzle in the middle of summer? That, my friend, is something that I have no idea about. <laughs> the southeasterly, murky, oops, 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 murky, murky stuff. Uh, let's go back. There we go. The southeasterly, murky, murky stuff. High pressure systems. What did we say at the beginning of the thing? They are areas of descending air where there's no cloud and there's no rain, correct? Wrong. Okay, so in meteorology, what is black is white and what is white is black. Okay, so in a high pressure system, when you are driving southeasterly winds into the south coast, is it coming from the ocean or the land? Ocean. Is it dry or wet? Wet. It's got cloud, but you have descending air, so the depth of the cloud is not that high, but it squeezes that band of cloud there and it sits there and it gives you all of that mucky crappy stuff, all of that southeasterly stuff. That is why Melbourne is such, anybody from Victoria before I go any further here, <laughs> is such a shithole because it is sat in that southeasterly for days and days and days. It's no wonder they're so miserable there. Okay? The default setting for Melbourne is ugh, and it's just horrible. Those southeasterly drizzly winds are in there all the time. That high pressure system sitting there just drives that rubbish into them. Okay, so what is black is white and what is white is black in meteorology. Okay, so the surface pattern will be the, the reason for that. So when you've got that high pressure system sitting in the bite the way that it does, it will drive southeasterlies into the coast, the onshore flow, and that will give you drizzly cloudy weather. Except as you go further to the north, that moisture content dries out. So by the time the southeasterlies get up in towards the escarpment, it's pretty much dried right out. What happens when it hits the escarpment to the east of Perth? That air, what's it gonna do as it hits those range of hills? Is it gonna go up? Yep. Is it gonna cool and condense? It will cool, but it won't condense because all the moisture's been squeezed out of it 
And then it goes down over the other side of the escarpment and you're left with little or no cloud at all. Okay, you might get a bit of cloud going up there because most of the moisture has been deposited on the south coast because we're generous that way. Okay, like to give you some moisture. So with that subtropical ridge being in the south, we get these very hot, dry, easterly winds. What does that mean for our rainfall pattern? Pretty much this. Oh, he said, let's go that way. That is the annual rainfall distribution for the whole of the state, annually. Wet area in the north, wet area in the south. Then when you look into the summer months, what are you seeing? Wet area in the south, uh, the winter months, sorry, wet area in the south, dry area in the north. Now remember, we've talked about the southeasterly winds into the south coast. That southeasterly wind up into the north, up into the Kimberley, the Pilbara, how many lush green forests do you see in the Pilbara? Zero. None. The Pilbara is good for growing rocks, okay? Because those southeasterly winds are so dry, there's no moisture in there. The only way they get moisture is when they start to bring stuff down from the north via tropical systems, okay? So that's why it's so dry up there. That southeasterly flow, that's why every man and his dog at the moment is up there enjoying the beautiful sunshine through Broome and the Pilbara and the Kimberley. Okay, because there is no rain, there's no precipitation, there's no cloud. It's beautiful up there. Different matter when it comes into the summer. So in the summer months, you have all of the moisture up in the north and very little in the south. Okay, All down to nothing more than the global circulation pattern. The rain is being driven by that onshore flow and you've got cold fronts driven in amongst it into the southwest. And then in the summer months, we have none of that because the ridge has moved to the south and we're under the influence of dry easterly winds. So how do we get rainfall in the summer? Ooh, that's a teaser. Okay, that's a teaser. So just to emphasize that, this is the typical rainfall distribution from Albany and Broome. Okay, here we can see that peak coming up into July. We should start to drop off from here on in, whereas in Broome, it peaks up around January and February. Okay, so you're starting to see that there is that distribution change going on between the seasons. Doesn't always happen that way though. Some of the wettest months or wettest days in WA for Perth, sorry, in, this, uh, in, in an annual sense, is in January and February because they're starting to see some tropical stuff coming down. And if you get a good tropical system moving down and the conditions are right, I'm not talking Albi now, I'm talking one that will actually deliver rain rather than wind, you'll get some really heavy rain down here as well. And it may be more than the rainfall that you will get in the winter. So tropical systems in the summer can deliver good rainfall. They're just not as reliable as the winter systems. The other thing that we need to take into account is not just the global circulation pattern. Um, we, we need to look at things called climate drivers. Okay, so we've got a few marked on here. Um, we've got the subtropical ridge. That's the one that we're talking about all the time. We have trade winds that are marked on there as well. Don't worry too much about that because that's up in the north. But this is a thing that everybody talks about. El Nino, Southern Oscillation. And then this latest one that's coming out, everybody's talking about, is the Indian Ocean Dipole. Okay, and then to the south, there's this other one that's starting to get really popular called the Southern Annular, the Southern Annular Mode, or SAM. Okay, probably in a couple of years' time, when the Bureau gets bored, they'll find something else to confuse you with, because they're like that. Sitting around in Melbourne, got nothing else to do because it's horrible. Let's throw something else in there, shall we? <laughs> What about this one? Oh, I know. Madden Julian Oscillation. That's a good one. What does that mean? Bug it if I know, but we'll put it out there. Sorry, shouldn't be so cynical. I'm retired. Don't give a shit. <laughs> Don't give a shit at all. So, sub, the climate drivers. The climate drivers essentially, for, for really, really general sense, is differences in sea surface temperatures. Difference in sea surface temperatures in the Pacific Ocean are the El Ninos and the La Niñas. Being the Pacific Ocean, the impact that the Pacific Ocean has on the western side of the continent is minimal. 
okay? Indian Ocean Dipole is a change in temperatures in the uh, sea surface temperatures in the Indian Ocean, funnily enough, okay? Now, nobody cared about that until some scientists in Melbourne discovered it actually has an impact on Southeast Australian rainfall. And guess where all the research funding went? Melbourne, yeah. Look, could have an impact on Southeast Australian rainfall. What about WA? Who cares about WA? Nobody, okay? So there's a lot of research going on into the IOD now, and that's why you're starting to hear a lot about it at the moment, because it's getting them all excited, because, hey, it could have an impact on the rainfall in Southeast Australia. Never mind what it does in WA, you can go for your life. We don't care. Shut the borders, get on with it. Lockdown. <laughs> We're going to move everything from the Bureau into Melbourne. You can all take a running jump. We don't care. <laughs> Cynical? No. <laughs> so the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO to give it its correct term, is basically the difference in the temperature on the eastern side of the Pacific compared to the western side of the Pacific. There are three phases. Okay, there's a neutral phase where everything is hunky-dory and nothing is changing. There's a normal distribution. There's a positive phase, okay, and that is when, he said, having a look, you have to look at um, the difference being that all of the warmer temperatures are now over towards the eastern Pacific and all of the cooler temperatures are being sucked away and they're back over in towards the central Pacific. That's a positive one. A negative one, and basically what that does is it takes all of the convection from that global circulation pattern away from, w, uh, away from Australia in towards the central Pacific. The opposite to El Nino is La Nina and that is the negative phase of ENSO. And that has the colder than normal temperatures of the water near the eastern Pacific. Okay, and then the warmer temperatures are over towards Australia and that has the impact of driving those convective clouds back towards Australia. So negative is good, positive is bad for rainfall. Indian Ocean Dipole is exactly the same, but in the Indian Ocean. And here, the positive phase is when you have cooler than normal temperatures over the Indonesian area and warmer than normal over the Indian area. And the negative phase is when you have warmer than normal temperatures over the Indian, Indonesian area and colder than normal over the Indian area. Negative brings rain, positive doesn't. So, Indian Ocean Dipole, negative is good, positive is bad. El Nino, negative is good, positive is bad. Southern Annular Mode, negative is good, yes, for rain, yes. A negative SAM is good and a positive SAM is bad. And when you get all of those negatives running together, you get a bucket load of rain, okay? But if you get them working out of phase, things can change. So negative is good, positive is bad. Remember that, a bad forecast is a good forecast. No, it's not, a bad forecast is a bad forecast. So you have negative, positive, and neutral phases of these three, of the SAM, the Indian Ocean, and the ENSO. The SAM can only really be effectively forecast about two weeks out, whereas the IODs and the ENSOs are effectively forecast about six months out. And it's these climate drivers that are really, really important. Okay? If you have an understanding of what the climate drivers are meant to give you, because they're based on sea surface temperatures and the oceans take much, much longer to respond to changes in pressures because of the changes in temperatures, you get a longer lead time in that forecast. So whilst we all do like to joke about how rubbish weather forecasts are, once you go beyond that 10 day period, you're starting to move into the climate forecasting and these sorts of things are pretty good for giving you an indication of where they're going. That doesn't mean that they will give you an accurate forecast, but they will give you a trend, okay? Now, the difficulty is that every single one of these events is different from each one. You'll see that. It's almost like a disclaimer. Please note, we take no responsibility for this forecast whatsoever. Okay, that's the problem that we get. You might say there's going to be a, ne a negative Indian Ocean dipole, 
But then all of a sudden, the SAM, the Southern Annular Mode, which is essentially the position of the high pressure system, goes into a positive phase and pushes high pressure systems up over the southwest of WA. So whilst you may have that negative Indian Ocean Dipole, you've got a positive SAM. There are no weather systems coming up at all. And it doesn't matter if the Indian Ocean temperatures are 12 degrees above average. If you've got no weather to drive them in, those moisture-laden winds, then you're not going to get any, any rainfall out of them. So you have to be careful. It's not one size fits all. So a more fundamental question then, we, we've got the global circulation pattern and we've got those, those climate drivers. So why does it actually rain? <laughs> I've got all day. Why does it rain? Water's heavy. That is so close to the truth, it's not funny. Okay? That's exactly right. You start off with water vapor. Okay? We cool it, we condense it. And we condense it into water. And then hopefully the water gets too heavy and then it starts to fall. So there are mechanisms to do that. What you need to do is to first of all make that water condense, that water vapor to condense. So to do that, you've got to cool it. And to make it cool, you make it rise. That's the easiest way to do it, or not the easiest, but it's one way. Um, you also need to have these little things in here, things called condensation nuclei. And you can see the sizes of that, 0 0.002 or 0 0.0002 of a millimetre. The water vapour must be able to condense onto something. Okay, so these tiny, tiny little drops or specks could be dust, atmospheric uh, pollution, could be volcanic ash, could be marine salt. It's always there. There's never a completely clean atmosphere. And so the water vapour grabs onto that and then condenses onto it. It then grows by colliding with all of the other little uh, water droplets into a cloud droplet of about that size. Now, I point that out because that size is the reason why you don't see cloud on radar. 0 0.02 of a millimeter is too small for a radar to pick it up. Okay, so you don't see cloud on radar, but you do see these things. So it grows from that to that, and it does that by a number of, or a couple of ways. The droplets themselves just collide and stick with each other as they're moving around. So if we've got air that's going up, okay, that's making the air rise, and it will support it. It will support that water droplet until the water droplet gets too big. And typically, um, we're looking at a drop of around about two millimetres. And that's where you get your southeast drizzly stuff coming in. The air that's coming up isn't that strong. The updrafts aren't that strong. What happens during summer thunderstorms, though? How big are the raindrops that you get then? And what else falls out of the sky with thunderstorms? Hail. And how big can that be? Pretty bloody big, you know, you're talking cricket ball size. So how big or strong must the wind be that's going up? It's running up at around about 100 kilometers an hour. That's the speed at which the air is going up, okay? And it's coming back down at pretty much the same speed as well. So if air is going up in one direction at 100 kilometers an hour and then coming down very, very close to it at 100 kilometers an hour, can you imagine what it's like flying through that area? That is why when you're flying and you go anywhere near a thunderstorm, oh, actually, we don't fly anymore, do we? No. <laughs> Forgotten. We used to have things called aeroplanes, didn't we? Airports, places called Europe. I think Europe's mythical. I don't think it exists anymore. Um, so when you get those sorts of things going on, you get thunderstorms, you get all sorts of turbulence going on, lots of rubbish and mess. It's horrible. Okay. But this process of just these things banging together doesn't work in there. You have another process that's then going on, and this is where meteorology starts to get really, really confusing, because then you get to have clouds that are growing up, and they then go through the freezing level, and you have something called a ice process that goes on. And instead of having condensation nucleus like this, you have ice crystals forming, and they clump together much, much better than these things just banging together and you get big, big sizes. So when people say to us, can you seed cloud to make it rain? 
What they're doing is that they're injecting into the cloud more of these nucleus or ice crystal formation parcels, silver iodide is the preferred thing, and they inject that into a cloud and that gets this freezing process to work, but only if the cloud itself has gone through the freezing level. If it's below the freezing level, it's not going to work. And very often in the summer, we're struggling to get that to happen. And certainly in the winter, we're struggling as well. So cloud seeding is not a real solution to our problems here. The other thing to note as well is we said on there, warm air holds more water than cold air. Now, can you recall some of the imagery we've seen in the last few weeks coming out of Europe? coming out of North America of floods. These floods, these flash floods that we're starting to see now are a direct result of a warm atmosphere, an atmosphere that can hold far more water than it used to be able to do. So when it's released, it's released in greater quantities. And this is a signature of a warming atmosphere and a signature of climate change. So how does air rise? Uh, there's a number of ways. You can make it go up over a mountain. Okay, there aren't too many of those around in WA. A front, we get a few of those, or convection. They're the three main formation methods. So frontal activity, basically you get an area of cold air moving up from the south. It acts like a shovel and pushes the air up in front of it. What does air do as it rises? Cool, condenses, cloud forms. Okay, and you get this broad, broad area of cloud forming on that front. Convection is different. Okay, it's localized heating. The heating makes the air rise, cools, condenses, and you get cloud form. But it is con it's a convection form, and it is very, very localized. So on the front, um, I'm sure we've seen far too many of these charts. Um, you've got that broad area of cloud being formed by the front on the ground. It's going to look something like that. Large sheet-like cloud giving you rain over a broad, broad area. And when you start looking at it at that broad area from a satellite image, you start to see these long, long bands of cloud streaming down. They give you long periods of rain and pretty widespread. So when you're looking at the rainfall distribution, you start to see those sorts of patterns, okay? It's different when you go to the convection because the convection in the summer months is far less widespread and far more random, okay? That's the sort of thing that we're looking at for a pattern. That's what it looks like, okay? So you can imagine the person sitting in the middle of that going, yeah, great forecast bureau, well done. And somebody out here said, what a crock of, never get it right, okay? Very, very localized. On a satellite image, looks something like that, okay? With the areas of red marked out, those thunderstorms. These areas in here may have been uh, Earmarked as being response, uh, possible thunderstorms, but we've got them further to the northeast, so it's really tricky, the summer rainfall, and it's less reliant than winter rainfall. Now, rainfall forecasts themselves are a real key problem. Any rainfall forecast is a probability forecast, okay? How much rain is gonna fall at any one particular time? You, when you think it's gonna be raining, you have a number from 0.2 of a millimeter up to 11 millimeters. Okay, 11 T is a very big number. And 0.2 of a millimetre could be 98% chance of 0.2 of a millimetre, but when you're getting down to 11 millimetres, it might only be a 1% chance. You could give that as a forecast, but how much use is that to you? It's not much use. So what the Bureau does is they give you a 50% chance and a 25% chance and then a 10% chance. They give you the most likely, the most likely highest, and probably the most likely heaviest. Three values are given to you. Produced in this sort of format, the possible rainfall or the chance of any rain is how much, what the probability is of any rain. Okay, 0.2 of a millimeter. It's a 30% chance on this particular one. But the total amount that we're looking at, so it's 30% chance of 0.2 or more, but there's less than a 50% chance of that being 0.2. So when they say, oh, it's a 30% chance, well, really, it's not, is it? Because 50%, it's not likely to be anything at all, okay? Two millimetres is up at around about 25% chance of two millimetres. So it's not much of a good forecast, that one. 30% you know, chance, so what? 0.2, who cares? 
In Meta, you can get that in different formats. You can get that in a graphical format. Okay. It, this is the forecast for today. There's no chance of any rain today, as I said, but when we move to Monday, okay, we're looking at around about a 50 to 75% chance of rain, of 0.2. That's what we're looking at there. So you get that in all sorts of graphical formats. You can also look at it in this format, in a tabular format, and then you can even bring that up in three hourly time steps as well, if you wish. All of this is still available. It will be changing in its format very soon, I believe. When you go to the three month outlooks, it's changed again. It's probability forecasting. So on this one, for Albany, uh, we're looking at around about a 210 millimeter average, and there is about a 66% chance of it being 200 millimeters or more. That you can interrogate on the climate outlooks. So I don't know if you knew that at all. So that, that's pretty good information that you can get from those. The outlook will also give you the climate drivers, talks about the Indian Ocean Dipole and ENSO and what they're doing. So now we know negative is good, okay? Negative ENSO is good, negative dipoles are good, positives are bad, all right, in terms of rainfall production. And we don't want any rain at the moment, do we? No. Except for we're going to get some on Monday. Sorry about that. Um, finally, very, very quickly, just wrapping up, um, changing climate. What we're looking at is basically a continuation of the drying climate. <laughs> This year, yeah. Um, but the, the forecast going forward is saying there's no change. We're not going to return to the 1940s type of rainfall. So we're looking at a continuation of that dry and rainfall. We're looking at the continuation of the warming temperatures. Okay. We're also starting to see sea levels rising. What does that mean? It means that storm surges will go further inland. So Bustleton's in real strife. Okay, their sea surface, uh, the sea surface, the storm surges are going to be much, much worse for them. Marine heat waves, that may not be that big a deal to you, but for people who are trying to make a living fishing, that's a real critical one. So heat waves there, it will lead to coral bleaching, tourism industries getting affected and all sorts of things like that. Um, we're expecting to see fewer cool days, fewer cool nights. Stone fruit growers um, in the Manjimup area um, and around uh, Kirup and places like that. Set, getting the frost to set the fruit, they're becoming less and less frequent. Um, tropical cyclones, we're expecting to see fewer, but the ones that we do see will be more intense and will give heavier rainfall, where we'll be slower moving and will give you more damage. It's cheery this, isn't it? Um, rainfall decline, as we mentioned, heavier rainfall to become more intense. We're seeing that in Europe now. And then fire weather days, we're expecting to see more fire weather days. That also has an impact on the people who fight the fires. Okay, if you're spending more and more time fighting the fires, you have less and less time for holiday, making you more and more tired. Where do the vast majority of firefighters come from? Volunteers, okay? People are tired. People down in the southeast fighting fires don't get down to Esperance as frequently. Okay, what does the impact have that on the local economy in Esperance? There's not as many farmers going down there on holiday because they're all knackered. Okay, yeah. Fire overnight temperatures as well. That's one of the issues with fire control. Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It goes hand in hand with the, the less cool nights. And the winds are stronger as well. That's the other thing. But, as I've mentioned, I'm retired. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>